The Spin-Off Podcast Network. K-pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The Spin-Off's new documentary, k p o l i s follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K-pop. In a one-off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. When you start dressing, looking different, everyone side-eyes you. But in K-pop, they're just like, no, like, celebrate yourself. Watch k p o l i s today at thespinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callaghan Innovation, New Zealand's innovation agency. Here's your host, Simon Pound. You all would have been there, being in a city and wanting to do the kind of stuff the locals love, not just go to the places you'll find the tourist lines. But how do you cut past the dubious wisdom of a crowd and get those personal recommendations? Well, perhaps you could do it with an app that has been described as the Tinder for things to do, Roma. Although quite new, this app has been accepted into Vodafone's own, picked up tens of thousands of users, some impressive partnerships with the likes of AA Travel, and it's just announced funding from some big names in New Zealand tech, like Ben Keeps and our past guest, Hadley Ford. To chat the journey, the future, and connecting people and experiences, CEO founder Emily Hazelwood joins us now. Kia ora, good morning. Good morning. Hey, so tell me, how did you come up with this idea for Roma, the The Tinder of things to do. <laughs> um, so I was travelling quite a bit for work between Wellington, Auckland and Melbourne. And um, every time I got to places and had a few hours free, I didn't know what to do. And so I would ring friends or I would um, reach out to people I knew who knew all the hotspots. Um, it wasn't really a scalable thing. You know, it was quite annoying me having to do it every time. But it was amazing what I found. Like a friend told me about a really cool cocktail bar and this must-try cocktail in Wellington. And, um, and then another underground hidden speakeasy in Melbourne. And so realising that there was all these incredible things that were not on the, sort of the travel lists or it wasn't about the experience, it was about places. Um, and it wasn't personalised. So I think for me there was seeing that there was a gap in the market, something needed to happen. And I think... I think we all want more, you know, sort of personalised um, suggestions. And people love sharing those, don't they? Like, I mean, <laughs> you've got the very famous examples like your trip advisors or, your, you, you know, Zomato or whatever, where people are out there doing lots of um, kind of public uh, opinion sharing. But then when you, when you say you're off to Tokyo or something, a friend will go, oh, I'll send you this list of recommendations a friend sent to me. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what our goal was, is how do we um, how do we incubate those really incredible suggestions and share them far wider than what friends and family can just do? Because I think there's a lot of like-minded people in New Zealand that will have really good um, suggestions that would suit you. Um, and so it was trying to get a way in which we could get those th- those to you when you need them. And so from that feeling, there should be an app for that. <laughs> How did you go about kind of uh, deciding to um, deciding to follow it further and feeling out the edges of, you know, what might be the most useful way to do it? Yeah, so I... Um I was in Wellington again and um, we were up there for work and had the afternoon free and this is when I thought, oh my goodness, this is actually, I'd only had the idea for a week and I just said, look, this is I just this is just frustrating. Like I just need some cool things to do um, and I didn't particularly enjoy Wellington at this point because I didn't really ever have something that I really enjoyed doing there um, and so that was when I was like, right, this has to happen. I've had some really good experiences with friends. How do we make this bigger um, and better? And so um, just sketched up some designs, sketched up what I thought, and actually just went really quickly to reach out to a company um, overseas. 
which was not the company we use in the end, but it was um, just learning all those things like lean business, competitor analysis, getting those things done, which I probably was a bit green and didn't prepare for when I reached out to them. What were So what were you working on in the first instance? Were you working inside a tech environment? Was um, sketching out an app kind of a standard <laughs> thing to be doing on a trip? No, not no. at all. <laughs> it was, um, no, we were, so my um, where I was involved in was property, so commercial property, very traditional industry. Um, so it was dealing with um, large tenants around New Zealand for industrial spa- um, industrial and commercial buildings. Um, so very different, you know, not very involved in tech at all. I mean, I used apps for pretty much most aspects of my life at this stage, but wouldn't have a clue how to, you know, how to create one at all. And so by looking around, did you see, well, there's a gap and then this is what I think it should be like. And just as a digital native, it was like, well, this is just how I'd expect it to work. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, where's my app for this? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It was it was just going, well, there's got to be a solution. Um, I didn't at this point actually do much research and that's probably something I could have done earlier. Um, I think we're all quite green when you come into an idea and you think you're the only one with it. So for me, it was like, this is going to work. Everyone's going to love it. Let's just get on with it. Um, and at the time, I had enough um, enough savings to buy a house. So I thought, well, buy a house, create a business. You know, I, I think at this age, you've got to, you don't really have too many things you've got to worry about. So I think it was the perfect time to really go risk it. And then how did you take that idea from uh, what you wanted to do and kind of build it out to get, what, what was the kind of insight about how can we get people to share the things they love? And then... What was your insight as to, well, how can we make money out of this? Yeah. <laughs> so um, early on, I, I just did a really quick search and found in-app native advertising was the fastest growing um, marketing channel globally. And it works for me. I mean, I, I like ads on social media. I like um, I don't follow a lot of traditional ads anymore. And I mean, millennials, the generation we know are some of the hardest to get to. And so um, I always knew there was potential. Um, and these businesses that have amazing things could pay for it, could pay for being in front of these places, people. Um, and so we always knew native in-app advertising was the revenue stream for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting people to upload, it was just hoping that there was more personalities like me that wanted to share them. And, you know, we've cracked into it and there's been some just incredible people throughout New Zealand, Australia that are just avid uploaders and even shock us in our own city of what they're finding. So how does it work? How does someone uh, get, how does someone find it? How does someone get hold of it? And then how do they um, become someone that contributes to it? Yeah, so I mean, to find the app, um, we're about 75% organic download. So word and mouth is huge for our business um, and obviously something we're always working on. Um, so word of mouth is huge. Um, people then download it. They jump into the app and straight away they are um, seeing suggestions of things to do around them. So you know they can engage in it, and they can see that there's other people uploading the content. It's not um, not it's not tri- typical content. It's um, curated by locals. So at that point, there's a big button similar to Instagram that just says upload, and um, and then they can upload in probably under a minute and share something really cool. And I mean, other other influential people on the app have influenced over ten thousand um, experience moments for other people. So I think it's just realizing. Should I share this photo and get likes or should I share an upload and um, actually see hundreds of other people go do it? And how does that work? Is it kind of um, moderated or do you say what kind of experiences you want people to pop up or do you, do you discourage people from you know <laughs> advertising their own businesses? Because you know the, the wisdom of crowds is also yeah. often um, <laughs> <There's> <laughs> the <always> challenges <laughs> of, uh, of crowds as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I did a test study in um, UC, so brought some pictures along, got 15, 20 people in the room and got them on the first version. And it's when we didn't have... Um, the ability to say yes and no to things. So there's a whole lot of silly uploads and this is when we go, right, this is going to be the demographic of this room. It'll be the demographic of New Zealand, um, you know, a, a small percentage of New Zealand. Um, so we we realise we have to curate it. We have to say yes and no, especially because that's our brand. You know, we want people coming back and loving their last experience. Um, and then we also found setting the tone. So each city we launch in, we do about 100 uploads ourselves um, and setting the tone around how, how we think the language is, you know, instead of saying go to Ortolana go to Autolana for the best iced mocha. And so you're setting that tone where other people are going, oh, actually, I know a really good, um, I know a really good croissant place. How do I add this? So just setting it so they think and they understand the sort of brand. And do people earn points past kind of kudos points? But, you know, if they give 10 great experiences that hundreds of people enjoy, do they then kind of 
gain uh, things they can exchange for goodness in the real world or the fake world? Yeah, so um, so what we've done is we've really tested that. We've seen who's been uploading the most and it's massive the amount of influence people have had. So we're currently working with our, um, listed businesses to look into a way of rewarding them. So, you know, go influence X amount of people, get um, another experience free. So we are looking into that at the moment. Obviously, it is a um, big thing to scale, a lot of different free experiences and different people. Um, the other model we're looking into is um, pay per um, upload, like approved upload, um, and earning through that. But again, we want to incentivize people the right way. So give them more experiences, give them what they want. So um, that will be coming this year. And in terms of those experiences, like uh, I-, I saw that 40% odd were either free or very kind of affordable. Uh, so so there is a focus on non-commercial experiences as well. And I, I, I see that those are things like walks to the waterfall yeah. or, um, you, you know, uh, points of interest in a city. But um, the other side of this, which is quite genius business-wise, is that, you know, you are actually also providing a conduit to small businesses and people who will advertise for their experiences. How does that work? So, um, so what we found is that like anyone we don't want to be sold to. You don't want to scroll through a list of prices pretty much and know you're being sold to. Um, and that's not our goal. Our goal is getting people out and about and it doesn't matter. We don't make any money from what they do. Um, and so it doesn't really, we want them just to have the best experience. And early on we found the most trending content was actually some of the hidden waterfall walks. You know, it was these free things that people can pick up and do in the afternoon. Um, a good example was two waterfall walks in Christchurch that no one really knew about. Like It was mind-blowing the amount of traction those places have got now. And it's a good thing, you know, it's helping disbursement through the city, it's helping this place get um, utilised and hopefully more people on the track um, and mental, positive and physical health for people. So that was a big thing for us is let's give them more of what they want um, and obviously help businesses so all the cards currently um, if you upload it's a free upload so you could suggest anything you want and that business will start seeing value provided to them so they'll start seeing customers interested however it's a huge huge difference for um, businesses advertising like um, incredible um, results considering there's about five and a half thousand things to do on the app now. So in Auckland alone, you're competing with about 1,000 other things to do. Um, but yeah, so businesses that feature get up towards the top, they get um, a far higher click through and a far higher um, turn up rate as well, which is really important for them. And in terms of that, you know, thousand experiences in Auckland, what's the breakdown between people who are locals wanting to kind of go deeper in their city or, or find new things to do? And, and you know, your kind of original use case, which was, shit, I'm in town for a couple of days, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, what we found is the gap was in the local market. So there was definitely um, a lot of tools out there for tourists. So our goal was locals, help the locals love their area, help the locals know about their area. So when there's a tourist in town, it's a suggestion they can make that, hey, here's something around the corner or here's an app you should use that can help you. Um, so it's really curating that core base of people. Um, yeah, so we've got a lot of locals using it, definitely a huge amount of locals using it. But also, I mean, I was at the bank and the guy who's just moved here um, three months ago, he goes, um, I said, you know, we're traveling to Singapore, we're going to launch in Singapore on Roma. And he said, no way, this is the app that I was told to download when I arrived in Christchurch. So there is that tourism and that was a local telling him. So that's sort of the what we were going for. How did you get that first content on and get that first push? Was it kind of lots of leaning on friends? Was it, you know, you know, like, and, and, and when did you first see that it was getting out of your, um, your initial kind of group of people that you've touched in some way. Yeah, so um, I did, the, one of the best things we ever did was I had a lovely girl working for me as an intern. Um, we did a giveaway to University of Canterbury and had about a thousand email lists straight away. So here's a thousand people that were ready to go as test trialers for us. Um, we, as soon as we had beta, we sent it straight to them and we started seeing a whole lot of patterns that we weren't quite expecting. So it was a really good way to learn about our product and learn about these people. We found from that we ended up, they ended up telling their parents or their friends. So we ended up just seeing this different sort of age breakdown happening just from who our core base was. Um, And so that was a big thing about what we saw happening within the people that were using it. And what does it take to kind of, you know, get from there to there? I mean... Is there anything left in the house saving account? Like how, <laughs> how how soon did you have to go full noise on it? And and as you were doing this, you know, in a kind of 
property obsessed country. Do yeah. people tell you you were bananas to be doing this? I mean, it's a crazy thing to invest in. Like, it really is. Like, technology is just bizarre. You know, you know you're, you're backing something that you just hope one day flourishes and you see results. And lucky we saw results early. Like, we saw traction very pretty much immediately and we saw scalability very early on in our piece. So, for us, it was a no-brainer to keep putting, um, keep investing in it. Smudge apps came on straight away and they said, look, we're keen to invest. Um, and I wasn't really, I wasn't in a position to actually need funding at that point. But um, I think for me it was, yep, let's get this on board. Let's sort of de-risk my side. Let's um, de-risk the whole thing. So next time we go for investment, we've got a company that's proven it can work, proven it can make money and proven it can scale. But no, I mean, I still, it is rough, isn't it? Um, You know, you don't pay yourself for quite some time, but luckily I didn't chip into all the savings. And in terms of that getting investment on, it's not just money, is it? It's kind of the confidence that if you've got an app maker invested, they're not going to be just charging up <laughs> bills. They're going to be trying to make the thing work yeah. and, and be as effective as they can. And how did you then go and kind of turn that um, t- turn that original traction into attracting quite a lot of what you, you know people generally call like smart money, people that have been through yeah. um, tech uh, companies before and so have practical experience to add as well as dollars. Yeah, so um, I've always been customer focused and I've always been metric driven. So for me, it was how do we get our cost per acquisition from $12 down to less than a dollar? Proved that, proved retention. We, I think, three and a half times retention. Um, and I just kept working on these metrics until you could fully see in front of you this plan that was a no brainer. It was an absolute plan where, you know, I had multiple bits of feedback from um, big investors saying, this is this makes total sense. It's actually incredible. You've proven you can scale, proven you can grow users, proven you provide value. Um, and then also just the, the connections, like I think, always taking opportunities to connect with these people or get an intro no matter who it was um, just helped me get in the room of these people um, you know these incredible smart investors and I think um, obviously being in Vodafone's own office was the lead into it all. How did that come about? So Green Eyed Emily was at Smudge and um, they've obviously got a really good partnership with Vodafone Zone. I think they saw I needed quite a lot more um, understanding of what technology is like. So they sent me to meet with um, Kevin Park, who was there at the time. Met with him. He saw potential and he said, look, you can use the space. Um, you know, come in, sit at the back of the sessions. So early on, I got a lot of value provided from Vodafone. Um, and definitely, I could not credit them enough for the amount of lessons and the amount of help I've had um, through their channels, really. And in terms of building out kind of a team around you as you went, How's that going? Because you've got, tell, tell us how many users and how, how much kind of activity is there happening on the app at the moment? Yeah, so there's thousands of users every single month. And I mean, even just last year, there was 1.5 million activities um, discovered in the Roma app. So there was a huge amount of um, action inside the app. Obviously, we're about to scale up again with our users and businesses. Um, but yeah, so traction, traction for users and businesses have just been a play on how many do we actually need compared to how many do we want? Because we scaled very fast in February last year when we launched in Australia, Um, but it was also getting very costly at that point. Um, And staff-wise, I've always used contractors. I found them just to be amazing. You know, it takes a lot more independence from them and you get a delivered a really fantastic result. Um, Our current developer, I'm trying very hard to get him on board full-time and hopefully we should get him soon, but he's just been amazing. Um, And also I've had interns um, come on board a lot and I've given them a lot of a free reign around let's learn marketing together um, and the results from that have been huge so growing a team for me has been definitely a challenge um, I'm quite an independent person and I love just getting into the office and just working all day so um, disruptions has been something I'm trying to learn to work with but just getting some more senior people has definitely helped that. What kind of things have, have worked like in terms of kind of you know growth hacking your way to yeah. um cutting down that cost per acquisition, for example. Yeah, I mean, I love... I love analytics. I love statistics. So for me, sitting there with a live dashboard going and going, let's try this, let's try this, it's literally just putting something up, let's try it, measuring it, and then cutting it or growing it. Um, So that's always been the goal. So we set some key areas we want to grow or change, um, and that's just worked. We've just found, you know, sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes it's a lot comes down to logic as well, like what will our users want. And user feedback's been huge. You know, ringing the users and saying, how did you discover us? Okay, that worked better than this one. Or what made you share it more? Okay, it's that feature. You know, so it's definitely been digging really deep into the data, but also the, the user feedback. And coming into tech and not having a technical or 
um, you, you know, a background that was specific to a general feature of, of running this. What things have you? What things have you found surprising, or you know, what things have been easier or harder than you might have expected from the outside? Yeah, I think um, I think getting people on board that know what they're doing and willing to teach me is huge. So having an incredible group of people that put it into layman's terms for me, you know, I don't know how to write code still, but I still don't understand how it works. And so that was a really, really big piece for me is if you don't know something, be around the best people that do. Um, That was definitely a game changer for me. Um, What was hard, I think, like we were discussing this morning, is a lot of people think um, people will flock to their product. And I mean, I think you you know, you know know how good your product is, but you assume that thousands and thousands of people are going to discover it in the first day of the App Store. Things have changed. You know, The App Store is harder than it's ever been. Um, and so just being realistic about going, we know there's going to be a cost per acquisition. How do, we do, how do we make that the smallest possible was something that was harder to face. I thought we would have had a lot more traction early on. Um, but we have had traction, but you've always got to have sort of a cost per acquisition going in there. One of the cool things about the the area is like the amount of available information online. Oh, hey, totally. like oh any goodness. problem you have, you're like, oh, good this, and then yeah, you'll see yeah. people have written a 90, <laughs> 90 scroll blog yeah. post with graphs and how tos. You're like, oh, that's copy and that's, paste. That's, that's handy. I'll <laughs> yeah. give that a try, and then it may not entirely work, but you've got lots of places to start from as well. That's hey. definitely been something. Like talking to people that are, um, you know, earlier on in the earlier on done these sort of things it's just amazing the information you can you can get into and I think even contacting people you know you find out this person's done this you why am I trying to figure it out myself why should I not you know politely add value to their day or something and actually ask them for something in return yeah and and Hadley Ford who was the um who's the CEO of Swiped On who was a guest on this uh, show who is one of your investors yeah he said some great stuff to us about you know it's amazing what you can do with Google and a bit of determination yeah, yeah. and and you, you know basically just being um sw- switched on yeah I think I think the biggest thing the investors found with me early on is how much I like to say funny so for me spending dollars it's you know I'm I'm the worst I don't like spending so I always find a cheaper way to do things and whether it comes down to finding some institutions who are amazing lawyers to keep the cost down or so many other things. I think that was um, a big thing you find out as a founder is how, how tightly can you do things. And so what are the plans now? You mentioned just before that you were looking to get going in Singapore soon. How do you choose a new market like that and what, what are the ones that are coming on board? Yeah, so we have an investor in Singapore who's um, very, very heavily connected over there. We did I did go over there uh, middle of last year, did a bit of research around it, found it was quite a different, dem- different um, audience and also found that the market size for us in Australia was a no-brainer with the organic growth we saw in Sydney off Melbourne. So Melbourne, Australia is going to be a lot more of a target this year for us. I think just um, sort of completing a few loose ends with New Zealand, especially in Auckland. We've had huge growth in the last month in Auckland, but just trying to figure out a few more loose ends in New Zealand and then really focus on Australia is the goal for us from here. It's English speaking, easy to understand, yeah. And is it a matter of kind of going where are our... Uh, where are our followers or users where are they traveling regularly to? travelling to? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's just seeing um, who's similar as well. Like the way Australians travel is the way New Zealanders travel, but the locals, you know, it's so easy for us to move over there and live. So it's just it's very like for like. And because of that locals factor, does that make somewhere like Bali, for example, uh, a different thing as you don't have the exact same? Um, you know, Australia, New Zealander, traveller yeah. kind of local uh, approach. I mean, so when we launched, we actually got Art Matilda to try it in Rarotonga. So within two days, I had to get Rarotonga um, curated with content. Now, the addresses, they don't have proper, you know, addresses for their businesses. And that was the first thing we came up against was, how do we tell them that there's a massage over here, you know? And so there's a few of these things that we find out pretty early. We did launch in Melbourne within a week. So um, we we saw how easy it was to drop Roma into a new city. Um, but I think the, the approach is spend a few thousand, drop drop the app in there, get some thousands of users, and if the traction stops, then it's easy enough to pull it. Like we don't need a team on the ground or anything too expensive. Right, right. so it's kind of uh, t- tag it into um, Google Maps with an overlay of where to go and just kind of um, pop down where we think the most interesting places are to start and see yeah. if we can get people on the ground actually uh, contributing to it. Yeah, I mean, and I think we saw a lot, a, a bit of a different demographic in Melbourne, like a lot more sharing in Melbourne organically. People just, people didn't even need to be told how to use it. They just started uploading um, and still uploading. And so that was something we saw, okay, this could work better for us, the Australian, you know, approach to it. And hopefully it's like that through most of the cities. 
And so you've just taken on a, a funding round with some pretty serious um, kind of people involved. What are the ambitions for the business? Like, where would we? Where, where, what would success look like for you uh, with with Roma? So, I mean, we, what we want to do is obviously just scale up every single thing we're doing. So, seeing the success our small businesses are achieving just through our low cost um, in app advertising, seeing the users using it, you know, months on end now, and discovering, I think we had quoted the other day, a young woman does about ten different roams um, in in a week or something. So, just seeing that scale up hugely is the big thing for us. We want to see thousands, thousands, or hundreds of thousands more people using it. Um, we want to see a, a whole lot more businesses um, positively gaining value from it but also like rewarding our users more so just trying to target a few more of those key metrics you know how do we get uploaders uploading even more and sharing some of their really cool secrets which will be something a model we're going to have to invest in to try and crack Um, but yet to really scale up so the investments focused on scaling team um, scaling sales and obviously scaling up our user base and how will you personally know that it's got to the point that you want it to? Like, what what will that look like for you? Yeah, I think when we see um, the organic growth exceeding, you know, uh, month on month, and we start seeing businesses come on month on month, um, and other other key met- metrics changing, so more visits per um, per user per month, um, I think that for us will be success. Like where we are at the moment is some really really amazing key metrics for what we're achieving. So it's just really doubling up on those every single you know few months, trying to get that to something that's really um, just hit the world, hit, hit, taken the world by storm really, like in New Zealand, Australia, just a sort of household name. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Well, thank you so much, Emily Hazelwood, CEO and founder of Roma, for coming and sharing your story. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much, Tina Tiller, for producing. And thank you very much for having us along and listening. Cheers. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. Brought to you by The Spin-Off and Callahan Innovation. From The Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring. Brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.